So uh, kind of just as an introduction, um, I think we can all agree that uh, climate, weather, climate change, things like these are, are something that's going to impact everyone, um, right? So it's raining outside right now. You might have taken like a lift instead of walking today because of the rain. Um, so from a climate science perspective, really there are uh, kind of two components to the, to the scientific field. So um, from the, the first point, we're really interested in understanding uh, the atmospheric system, the climate system better. So that involves using things like remote sensing, uh, using that to improve models, and then hopefully those models will provide better uh, predictions of um, our climate. But at the same time, it, it's, it's not very useful to kind of just do that and then throw it in a, a journal. Um, I don't really know many people that work all day, go home, and then like open up a, a journal of climate issue. Um, I don't even do that. So. Uh, Part of it involves kind of diagnosing and, and then communicating these impacts. Um, uh, I think that's also key to um, a job as a scientist. So um, this talk is going to be focusing on trying to find ways to connect with people, inform people, um, and, and overall help society prepare, uh, prepare for challenges that are coming up. Uh, so maybe just to reiterate that point, so uh, I have a picture here of the uh, IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is their 2013 report on uh, climate change, the physical science basis. Um, I mean, it's a phone book or, or even bigger, and um, it, it's difficult to motivate people with that. I mean, unless if you're maybe using it as a weapon. Um, otherwise, you know, I don't know. But, but pictures like this on the right side, maybe that motivates you a bit more. So um, a glacier in Peru kind of a, you know, multi, uh, you know, 30-year 30, 30 almost change um, in that glacier. Uh, so, so kind of looking at visuals um, as a key here, or maybe as another example, hurricane flooding. So this is Hurricane Arthur in 2014. So perhaps that might uh, be a motivator if, if you're in an area that's uh, going to have a hurricane land falling to, to do something. So, uh, yeah, just to reiterate that point, scientific studies and texts don't always motivate, so we need to really uh, illustrate that risk and communicate that properly. Um, so how does OSM fit into this? And I, I think it's kind of a, a unique niche because OSM really documents the world around us. It documents our lives, our cultures, uh, infrastructure, things like buildings, theaters. All, all of this, are, these are things that we interact with, uh, things that can be affected by climate and weather. And so if we use OpenStreetMap, we can kind of document uh, changes that are, that are going to occur on those. Um, and another benefit is that it's open source or open data. So we can take this data that people have collected about their lives, about their kind of 360 perspective, and uh, freely download that and, and analyze that and use that and, and display that. So um, from my perspective, I think that's a, a really big perk of the OSIM project. And then, of course, uh, this local detail. Um, but we have near global coverage. Um, I mean, there's going to be variability in the coverage. But uh, in general, you can go to, to many countries and find data. So as opposed to just being restricted to, to one county or maybe a state, you've kind of got that global reach. Um, so some of the OSM data I'm just going to be looking at uh, from a recent planet dump. Um, and then, of course, it's scientific talk, so I've got to have a data slide. Um, some of the other things I'm going to be using, so all of this data is freely available as well, so I'm trying to spread some awareness of this. So um, as part of that IPCC effort to um, understanding climate change, there's this big group, uh, so it's called the CMIP-5, or the, the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. So these are modeling centers all over the world that have come together and provide their data. So all of this data is, is available for analysis and use. Um, we also have some higher resolution data. I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, from the NASA Earth Exchange. Um, and then really uh, detailed model observations, uh, kind of uh, hybrids uh, of both uh, sea level rise that's mixed with uh, bathymetry and elevation modeling. That's from NOAA, as well as some surge modeling data that comes from the Hurricane Center. Um, and actually, I won't be talking about ramps today, but uh, we can talk about that after if you have any questions. Um, so just a word real quick uh, for some of the slides I'm going to be showing here. So OSM data is kind of just, uh, it's, it's data that has uh, latitude and longitude, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of all available. We've seen some talks about clustering and things, but, but for the most part, there's no real kind of um, ordered structure to separating it, unless if you're thinking about like map tiles. Um, climate models, however, uh, are 
just uh, call it a Gaussian grid, but it's essentially just a square grid. So you have like a, a two degree latitude by two degree longitude box. You have a single number that represents everything inside that box. So to kind of provide some comparisons between the two, um, I did just a little greeting of OSM data. So uh, some of these uh, pictures that I, or uh, graphs I'm going to be showing in a bit, I've kind of just clustered this data into um, smaller tiles that, that represent the climate model. So with this CMIP data, um, there are actually a variety of scenarios that, that um, it covers. And so one of the things is we're kind of uncertain with how greenhouse emissions are going to uh, change over the next few years. So we have these different scenarios. They're called RCPs, representative concentration pathways. And they kind of just represent different cases of how emissions are, are going to change over the next 100 years. And so um, I, I guess the bottom line here, just to get across um, to you in these Next plot, so the smaller number of RCP, that's kind of a, a, a lower change in your overall um, global temperature, but um, as the number gets higher, that kind of represents a, a, a much hotter planet. And you can kind of see that this is a very small graph, I apologize, um, but you've just got your CO2 emissions across this, and then each dot kind of represents 10 years. So um, some of these that, uh, so this is like the RCP 8.5. Some of these much hotter simulations are assuming that, that there's going to be a lot more CO2 that's being emitted. Um, so one of the variables we can get out of these models um, is something called the diurnal cycle, the mean diurnal cycle. And so that essentially represents the difference between your lowest temperature in the day and your, ho your hottest temperature in the day. So how much does it vary? How much warmer does it get? How much does it cool off at night? And so plotted here on the left is the change in that cycle. Um, over the course of um, about 100 years, so going from the 2006 to 2025, that's kind of the, the, the beginning of the model time frame, up to about the year 2100. So how does this cycle change over that time? And so areas that are colored in blue have a decrease in that um, cycle. So this essentially means areas that are in this blue are going to be experiencing less relief from heat at night. So it's not going to get as cold. Um, so you can imagine a, a variety of implications for this. Um, areas might need uh, more air conditioning, for example, to cool off. Um, you might have more health risks as people aren't able to cool off and kind of stay warmer um, throughout the day. And so we can kind of uh, essentially compare this to OSM data to uh, provide some information about uh, infrastructure, for example, that's going to be impacted. So I've just taken building counts as an example. So this is actually a log scale. But, but looking at the count of buildings um, across the African continent here, and we could start kind of comparing and finding areas that are going to experience uh, kind of the, the worst effects of this and, and um, start to inform on that information. Another um, quantity here is something that's called the signal to noise ratio. Um, I think the best way to describe this is a, a detectability. So um, looking between kind of those two different kind of lower cases, where are areas that are going to detect a difference between those? So um, this paper here provides some information. Uh, they talk about the inequality of climate change. So um, if we curtail emissions versus if we don't, what areas are going to experience the, the largest difference? What area is going to be most impacted? And so um, we kind of see along here the equator um, in the uh, maritime continent or um, Western Pacific whoops, um, region is going to be greatly affected by that um, according to these simulations. And so we can also take in OSM data and start to kind of pair this um, and get some idea of, of things that are going to be affected. But um, kind of doing it on this large scale, uh, we're sweeping a lot of things under the rug. Um, there's a lot of questions about um, completeness of OSM data. So uh, to some extent, you can say, well, this plot is basically a, a plot of areas that have been mapped. So um, one area I'm trying to explore, explore right now and um, provide some better context on is uncertainties in OSM data. Because if we can quantify um, or, or provide some estimate of, yes, there's probably this many buildings here, but it's going to vary by this much, um, then we can really use that information to kind of nail down what our priority areas uh, if you'll also notice, though, this is a very large grid. Um, it's about two degree by two degree. So we can also um, do what's called downscaling the climate model. So we can look at a much higher resolution. And uh, there are a few ways you can do this, but uh, one way involves just taking a single one of these boxes here 
and running a model embedded within that box. So you use kind of the, the uh, low resolution climate model output to, to force a higher resolution one. Um, and then the other way is looking at statistics. So you look at what's happened for the past 100 years uh, of temperature and rain, and um, you kind of use that distribution to um, scale or extrapolate your, your climate model simulations. So you can do it on a, a, a much higher resolution. Um, and so just kind of as an example, I took a few counties in Michigan, and I, I basically uh, segmented them by the average um, maximum temperature increase. So how, how, what's going to be your hottest temperature over the course of a month? Um, and then I looked at the different types of roads that exist in each of those counties and, and the um, links or areas of road that are going to be impacted by that. And so um, you can start to see that, uh, you know, we have a lot of residential roads in general. And so in some counties, those are going to be impacted a lot more compared to others. Um, but I mean, when you look at these numbers, the, these are pretty much the same anyway. So um, kind of looking at differences in, in this scale is maybe peanuts, because um, it's just going to be hotter everywhere. So we kind of need to plan for that. So climate models have a lot of data. I mean, this is really just kind of a broad brush uh, look at that. Um, merging OSM data with some of that climate model data, I think, is going to be important for trying to mitigate and understand risks. Um, but of course, there's a lot of uncertainties. Um, that need to be taken into account both from the OSM side, but then also from uh, the model side. So if we can look at maybe a, a little higher resolution now and um, approach the problem of sea level rise. So um, can we essentially plan for potential future scenarios of sea level rise across the United States as an example? Um, so the NOAA Coastal Management Office has a lot of information about very high resolution detailed sea level rise simulations. So we can kind of plug those in with OpenStreetMap data and provide not just uh, kind of a picture, but also a quantitative estimate of um, potentially where and how many buildings are going to be impacted. So I've taken uh, Miami Beach um, here as, whoops, uh, as just an example, and I have essentially contoured the different sea level rise scenarios. So as you get kind of a darker blue, um, those are areas going to be impacted by a higher sea level rise, um, all the way up to about six feet. And so we can actually take OSM data and overlay it onto this. Um, and so this is what uh, kind of many services have done, uh, maybe with other map providers. But OK, you can kind of uh, maybe eyeball it and, and realize, OK, some of this stuff is going to be really impacted. Um, but, but with OSM data, because we have that data in our hands, we can actually start to kind of segment this and actually plot some uh, distribution. So can we see potentially if there's a tipping point or some sort of level that's going to be a major shift? And so I've essentially just taken intersections of these different sea level rises for, for this area and plotted that as uh, a percentage of buildings impacted. And so you can see kind of this area around two to three feet uh, level of sea uh, rise is going to be an area that we have a, a large shift in the number of buildings impacted. So uh, a city planner, for example, might need to really um, focus on this and be planning for um, areas that are going to be impacted if it looks like we might be going towards those more um, extremes. And so this is kind of just uh, reiterates what I was saying about the sea level rise. Um, I'm in the process of doing this for the whole United States. We can kind of get a better idea of spatially of how this varies. Um, across different cities and then across states as well. Now kind of touching on the point of kind of communicating risk and connecting with people. Um, this is motivated also by, by recent events in the Carolinas. Um, in terms of hurricanes, people often think that wind and rain are kind of your only danger. So, okay, I can maybe survive the wind, the rain, it's not going to be that bad. Um, but especially for coastal regions, one of the big issues is uh, hurricane surge flooding. So as a hurricane makes landfall, there's a lot of water in the ocean that's associated with that that's coming in as a wave. Um, and, and so a question I'm asking is how can we improve communication um, of this uh, feature and, and of this risk. And so um, I think OSM provides a good opportunity for this um, to, to provide that localized information, kind of connect with people to maybe help motivate them to evacuate and, and realize that this might be an actual, uh, you know, life-threatening situation. Uh, and so I've taken a few uh, historical hurricane surge modeling simulations. So uh, what I've done here, uh, 
this is kind of difficult to see on the projector, but um, essentially we've gotten a, a 3D visualization of um, a city or of the world here, actually. Um, and we're overlaying the hype of uh, hurricane surge flooding on top of that. So um, again, it's a little difficult to see maybe in this slide, but, but down here at the bottom, you can start to realize kind of the, the impact and, and the scale of um, potential uh, surge flooding um, here uh, in the Florida Keys. And it's actually based on the, the different levels. So areas that are maybe a darker blue, again, are areas that are going to be higher up. Um, you can also do this uh, for other ones. So this is a Hurricane Sandy. This is a lower Manhattan as an example. Um, you know, say you go to this Starbucks down here, and you, you can kind of see on the map that it's underwater. OK. Uh, maybe that's going to be a big deal. I can't go get my Starbucks, so I should get out of here. I don't know. Um, you know, another example, looking at uh, state of the map 2014. So um, again, an, another uh, simulation from Hurricane Sandy. So, so really, this is about just trying to use OSM to, to connect with people and um, kind of communicate some of that risk and potential danger. Um, and so I'm going to be uh, working with some people to try and get this as a, a product that could be operationalized. Um, one other point here I'll, I'll um, bring to your attention is there are some ethical considerations with this. So um, we have to kind of tread lightly and make sure we're communicating the right message and also, again, taking into account these uncertainties and um, kind of variability that could be going on. Now, the last thing, and th this probably ties in most to um, some of the work I'm doing right now. Um, NASA, ESA, all these agencies, whenever they launch a satellite mission, um, either always or almost always, they uh, perform some study that's called an observation system simulation experiment, and, or OSSI. And so what these do is these try to quantify in terms of um, scientific value that a mission could bring. So as an example, say I'm going to be launching a satellite to improve tornado forecasts. So you're going to go through a scientific study. You're going to run some models. You're going to try and quantify how much you can improve those tornado forecasts. Um, so we can use uh, OSM, actually, to kind of take that to the next level. So right now, Aussies essentially are just a matter of, OK, we're going to look at scientific value, and then we're going to kind of stop there. So I, I've just kind of gone through a little hypothetical here. So say we've got Hurricane Noel here sitting in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and I'm just going to kind of throw this grid up here for now. In reality, Hurricane Knoll's probably going to be a bit bigger. Um, but even more importantly is there's some uncertainty with Hurricane Knoll's forecast. So if you often see hurricane center um, forecasts of um, hurricanes, there's also that cone that's associated with the hurricane. So that kind of represents the uncertainty in that uh, model estimate. So uh, let's say I'm going to launch a satellite mission here. Um, I'm, I'm creating some sort of observation that's going to have an algorithm, and it's going to somehow fly across this hurricane, whoosh, um, and it's going to reduce our forecast uncertainty that's associated with our hurricane. So normally, we would just quantify that. We'd uh, run some model studies, and then we'd say it's going to reduce forecast errors by like 10 or 20 percent, um, and that's going to be great. But what if we can also quantify that in terms of the societal impact now? What, what's going to be the improvement on society for that new observation. And so what I can do here is I can take Hurricane Knoll and I can run it into the Gulf Coast in a bunch of different places. And I can basically vary the uncertainty in the forecast, and I, I can also vary the size of the hurricane. And I can essentially trace out a plot here of the trade space between what um, the width of your storm would be and then what the forecast uncertainty is. So kind of this would be, uh, you know, as a hypothetical, your, your base case. And then as you move down on the y-axis, you're going to be decreasing the forecast uncertainty, which means you're going to be reducing the number of people that are going to be in that uncertainty cone. Um, so that's often called a false alarm ratio if you're in an uncertainty, but it doesn't actually hit you. So if we can reduce the number of people that we're going to say may be impacted, we can um, essentially measure the societal impact of that. And so um, we can do that for Hurricane Noel, and we can actually get this pretty neat chart um, that plots the uh, percentage difference of buildings that were in this original kind of uncertainty cone um, versus a new one that, that's much smaller. And so this, I think, is going to be uh, the next step for using Aussies to communicate uh, the importance of observations, of Earth observation missions in the future. And so OSM uh, provides this opportunity. It translates from a change in science, like forecast error, to uh, the benefit for society. 
Um, of course, there are uncertainties with all of this, and um, this is something that we're working on to um, kind of bring into the literature. So just some concluding thoughts. Uh, geospatial data here helps us paint a picture, risks and impacts. Um, that's because it really represents reality. So we're just trying to project reality onto uh, the model world so we can kind of quantify that. Um, I'll also make the point more detail helps us further refine these results. So uh, I don't know, say you want to look at the number of asphalt roads that are going to be impacted by higher temperatures, as an example. If we have surface data of asphalt roads, then we can actually use that. Um, and then, uh, you know, ethics of these simulations have to be considered. Also, this map completeness, accurateness, uh, accuracy metric, uh, this is something that uh, kind of needs to be addressed. And I think there are going to be some talks later that might provide insights into that, and I've seen some um, earlier in this weekend as well. So uh, with that, I guess I'll take any questions. And thanks. Any? Yeah. Can you say a little more about how you plan to use the downscaling approach? I'm just curious because, like, you're able to build environment features. You might be able to say, like, quantify the damages and the infrastructure expected from, you know, various. Yeah. So. Um, I've been looking a bit more. I, I mean, it, it kind of depends on the temporal scale you're looking at. So um, I don't have the slide here, but um, I mean, when you're looking even at monthly averages still, it's going to be kind of just a blob in terms of, of impact. Um, so I think what's more interesting is looking at uh, kind of the uh, variability within that downscaling. So say you're running a model in that kind of single grid. If you can run that a few times and see how things vary, then that can, can kind of provide you with an estimate of areas that are more likely to be impacted by, say, um, you know, tornadoes or, or rain or, or higher temperature. Any others? Yeah. Um, I mean, at least for, uh, you know, kind of this, this visualization thing, if I can go back to it quickly. Um, you know, trying to, to, to best represent reality, things about, uh, I mean, just basic information about the building, height, um, roof type, you know, whether it's a pitched roof, a flat roof, things like that, basically to just kind of help simulate reality. And then there's also LiDAR data that some of that could be extracted from. Um, so I'm, I'm still exploring that. Uh, it would be nice to look at things like um, occupancy rates, as an example, or kind of what, what it's built for, because that can kind of provide an estimate of, um, you know, population exposure, um, especially in areas that, you know, you don't have a proactive county that's going out there and has a really nice digitized um, set of land parcel data or, uh, you know, house property data. Yeah, yeah, basically land use, occupancy, and basic attribute, geometric attributes, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm about out of time. So, uh, again, there's my email address. Feel free to email me or come chat with me. I'll be here uh, leaving in the morning, but I'll be here the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you.